Okay, hello everybody and welcome. I'd like to begin by saying that the SWIG program in Jewish studies and social justice at the University of San Francisco acknowledges our presence on the unceded land of the indigenous Ohlone communities and pays our respects to these traditional caretakers and elders, past, present, and emerging. It is our intention that this acknowledgement plays a role, however infinitesimal, in a much larger process of confronting the past in order to create a not yet realized future rooted in justice. Welcome to the final event of the USF SWIG program in Jewish studies and social justice for the, um, for the fall semester, where tonight we will learn with professors Liat Berdugo and Shirley Bahar. My name is Oren Kroll Zeldin, and I am the assistant director of the SWIG program. Let me begin first by thanking uh, some people for their support for making this event possible. First, I'd like to thank the Department of Art and Architecture for co-sponsoring tonight's event, and also to the SWIG JSSJ faculty and staff, uh, especially to our director, Professor Aaron Han Tapper, and our rabbi in residence, Camille Shira Angel. And thank you also to our incredible program assistant, Victoria Farlow, without whom none of this would be possible. I'd like to take a brief moment to tell you about the SWIG program in Jewish studies and social justice. Founded in 1977, our program is the first Jewish studies chair or program at a Catholic university anywhere in the world. In 2008, we were reestablished as the SWIG program in Jewish studies and social justice, the first academic program worldwide to formally link Jewish studies with social justice. Including a minor in this field, in the classroom, the program offers a wide range of significant Jewish studies courses not found in other educational settings. And beyond the classroom, we offer extraordinary events that are free and open to the public, such as tonight's exciting event. We are currently working on planning our events for the upcoming spring semester, and we'll be announcing them soon. So please stay tuned. If you're not on our email list and would like to be, Shortly, I will put a link in the chat for you to sign up for our email list. Through the SWIG JSSJ program, we believe that education is the best long-term way to create systemic change. Whether one has the time to take a semester long course or a mere few hours to hear from a single speaker, education is fundamental to making our world better. It is paramount in shining the spotlight on the margins, on oppressed communities who are mistreated merely because of their race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, or another social identity altogether. Now, let me formally introduce tonight's event and our illustrious speakers. Tonight's event is titled, The Visual is Political, Citizen Videography and Documentary Cinema in Israel-Palestine. We are excited to welcome two scholars, Professor Liat Berdugo and Professor Shirley Bahar, both of whom have recently published groundbreaking scholarly books that address the visual image in Israel-Palestine. And they ask how the visual impacts the political and how resistance is embedded in people's self-representation of their lives. I will introduce them both individually, and then uh, each speaker will speak about their work. After Professor Berdugo and Professor Bahar uh, speak about their own work, they will engage in a conversation with each other. Following their conversation, we'll have time for questions from the audience. So at any time throughout the evening, you can post your questions in the Q&A box that I believe you will see at the bottom of your screen. So um, Liat Berdugo is an associate professor in the Department of Art and Architecture at the University of San Francisco. She's an artist, writer, and educator whose work investigates embodiment, labor, 
and militarization in relation to capitalism, technological utopianism, and the Middle East. Professor Berdugo's work has been exhibited nationally and internationally, and is currently on view at The Wrong, a digital art biennale. Her latest book, about which she will speak tonight, is titled The Weaponized Camera in the Middle East, Videography, Aesthetics, and Politics in Israel-Palestine. Dr. Shirley Bahar is an adjunct assistant professor in visual arts at Columbia University. Dr. Bahar's writing and curatorial work explores the relationships between representation, politics, and the body. Her first book, Documentary Cinema in Israel-Palestine, Performance, The Body, The Home, which is the subject of her talk tonight, was published in July of 2021. Dr. Bahar has published articles about film, performance, art, literature, gender, and queer representation from Israel, Palestine, Turkey, and the United States. Since 2013, she has been curating art shows, public, pu public, public programs, and community events in New York City and across the United States. So it is with great pleasure that I welcome Professors Liat Berdugo and Shirley Bahar to USF. Thank you, Oren. I will get my screen share set up and present. Um, thank you so much, Oren, for organizing this and Aaron and Victoria. And um, I am just so honored to be here tonight in conversation with you, Shirley, a scholar whose work I admire so much. So I'm really looking forward to this. And it's wonderful to be here in the USF community with colleagues and students and alumni and just the broader community that um, is drawn and is nourished and supported by the Jewish Studies and Social Justice Program. So I'm gonna talk for uh, just about 15 minutes and then I'll turn it over to Shirley before we have a dialogue and take discussions and questions from you as well. And feel free at any point to put them in the Q&A box as Oren mentioned. So I'm a new media artist and I teach here at USF in the design program. And I'm happy to be speaking about my new book, which came out this year. And I wanna start my talk with an image or a video still actually. This video was taken in Israel, Palestine inside the West Bank in a small rural village called Um Al Ahmad in the South Hebron Hills. And it's a camera fight between an activist and an Israeli soldier. We're each putting their cameras in each other's noses as a way to threaten the other, to confront the other, to record their side of the story in a quest for justice and to prevent the other side from recording. The activist here who frequently accompanied Palestinian shepherds to graze their sheep originally brought his camera to the field to document violations by Israeli settlers and soldiers. And here the Israeli soldier decided to film back at him, giving him what he later called the cell phone procedure. And then this whole scene is filmed by yet a third cameraman named Ahmed Hraini, a Palestinian volunteer with the human rights organization B'Tselem. The B'Tselem Camera Project is an initiative that began in 2007, three years before the Arab Spring brought vast attention to the emancipatory potential of technology. So B'Tselem as an organization distributes cameras to Palestinians living in the West Bank, East Jerusalem and Gaza, an effort to combat human rights violations of the Israeli occupation. And just to give you a little bit of context, Today, there are around 200 B'Tselem issued cameras in the field. And B'Tselem has amassed an archive of over 4,500 hours of raw footage, only a fraction of which is published online. One thing that distinguishes the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is the freedom to record. So Israeli law is more lenient on recording in public than the US state of Massachusetts. When I was living in Tel Aviv in 2013, I met the director of the B'Tselem Camera Project, and I began going into their headquarters to watch these videos, 
here's a screenshot of what the archive interface looks like. And I went to this archive to see the conflict through a lens that was not my own. So as a citizen of Israel, I'm forbidden by Israeli law from going to major Palestinian cities like Ramallah, Jenin, or Hebron. I couldn't see these things firsthand. And I've since gone to these places on my American passport to meet specifically with Palestinians who videotape. And as a visual artist, I come to this work with a very specific way, and that is this. I'm not an expert in Middle East studies, history, or politics, but I am trained to think about how things look. That is the aesthetics, the video frames, the framing, the visual realm and visual culture. And this visual approach is actually really important in Israel-Palestine because the Israeli occupation has devoted considerable national effort to a distinctly visual erasure of Palestinians by doing things like planting forests over the ruins of Arab villages or supplanting Palestinian Arab town names with Hebrew ones, creating visually separate, separated roadways to the West Bank for Israeli settlers only. And of course, building an eight meter tall concrete separation wall that literally blocks non-citizen Palestinians from view. And at the same time, the Israeli occupation has devoted significant attention to a distinctly visual domination of Palestinians by doing things like building watchtowers, engaging in aerial photography, surveillance drones, using strip searches, which of course are a visual tool, and having brigades of female soldiers who serve as what's called tatspitaniot or watchers who patrol live border cameras from remote viewing stations. And from a visual studies approach, which is the basis of my research, I see this conflict as one that's produced an inequality of visual rights. These rights include the rights to see and be seen, the rights to look and to surveil, the right to be out of sight of surveillance, for instance, and the right to have one's image trusted rather than subject to what's called digital suspicion through claims of photoshopping, cropping, falsification, and post-production. And I just wanna mention that this visual studies approach isn't unique to Israel-Palestine. It applies to many other conflicts like this country's police violence against black and brown bodies where citizens film the cops and cops film back with their body cams. And if we think about it, there are two kinds of shooting shooting with a gun and shooting with a camera. And there are also two different ways that a camera and a gun can be in relation to each other. So these are gunshot point of view and barrel point of view. So gunshot point of view is where cameras are aligned with weapons. So a camera is staring out down the sight lines of a gun. And an example of this here um, from 1948, this is um, when two Jewish snipers were stationed above Palestinians in the field below who were turning themselves in to be counted to the newly formed state of Israel. So here you can see the direction of the camera is aligned with the direction of the gun, right? They're both pointing at and capturing the same audience. Um, another example is this image um, from one of the most popular video uh, feeds on the IDF's YouTube channel. So in this video, drone enters Israeli airspace, is caught in the sight lines of a missile launcher and eliminated in a spectacular mid-air explosion. And nine out of 10 of the IDF or Israeli Defense Forces videos that are the most popular on YouTube are captured in gunshot point of view from a position of both literal power literal shooting power and also symbolic power visually. And contrast that with a barrel point of view, which is where cameras are positioned against weapons facing back at the barrel of a lethal weapon. An example of that is from the B'Tselem archives. So in 2013, a volunteer named Muhammad Awad was documenting a protest near his village near Hebron when he was hit in the chest by an Israeli tear gas canister. And the blow of tear gas canisters has killed Palestinian civilians, but luckily he survived. And he captured the exact moment of his own bodily injury with his video camera. 
So in the first video still on the top, you see the tear gas canister sort of hovering above the soldier's head. And then in the frame below, you see it grow larger as it approaches the videographer. Some Dalai volunteers said to me when I interviewed them, the camera is a weapon. That's what Imad Abu Shamshia said to me. And then he turned to my translator and said, it's a beautiful sentence, translate it. And I agree, it is a beautiful sentence. And it, I think he means that his camera is a weapon in the sense that it's not the kind of weapon that tries to inflict bodily harm, but instead one that tries to, tries to gain advantage or exert control over an opponent. So I want to show you what some of this footage looks like taken from barrel point of view. This is a 2017 published video by B'Tselem in which a volunteer named Ahmed Ziada videotaped his own arrest by Israeli soldiers. And I want you to know a few things this video before I play it. It's about two minutes long. Um, I find it difficult to watch. Um, it has English subtitles, but in the actual video, there's two languages being spoken. So first the soldier and the videographer speak to each other in Arabic. But when the soldier speaks into his radio or to his fellow soldiers, he switches to Hebrew, which is a language that a videographer doesn't understand. And I want you to pay particular attention to what happens right before the arrest. انت اللي شو تسوي هون؟ روح البيت انا في البيت انت شو بتسوي هون؟ روح البيت انا في البيت هيا في البيت انا كنت انا وعيالي انت اللي شو بتسوي هون؟ روح البيت انت اللي شو بتسوي هون؟ جيب الاويه نعم بيت سالم بيت سالم جيب الاويه هاي هوية فيش مشكلة بس بيت سالم جيب هاي هوية سي موزي ورب <تصفيق> فيش كاميرا تعالوا كدور عليهم ابعد عني ابعد عني ابعد عني كله على الكاميرا مبين كله على الكاميرا مبين كله على الكاميرا مبين ما تصورني شيف 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 خلي تيدي وجهك مبين شيف هي I always find myself flustered and a bit nauseous watching these videos. Um, but if we look at actually how the camera is functioning, I'm, I notice that Ziada uses his camera as a tool of exposure. So he catalogs the faces of the soldiers saying, here's the second one, here's the third. He defends his camera saying, not the camera. He uses exposure as a threat saying, all been recorded on the camera. And in the end, he declares hauntingly, your face can be seen as if to deter the soldier from violence. Again, in looking at this clip, I'm not exactly asking whether the detention was right or justified. I'm asking how the camera was functioning. And it's functioning as a tool of exposure. And this is the subject of the first chapter of my book. 
and the remaining chapters follow as a taxonomy of how the camera is used in the field. So is it used to produce shame in the other and to try to align the other into um, compliance extrajudiciously? Is it used as a mirror to reflect back someone's actions in the hopes that they um, change? Is it used as a shield to defend the Palestinian videographer who is filming? Is it used to create evidence in a court, um, in, a, in a judicial setting? Or is it used as a weapon to inflict harm and in that way act as a deterrent? And I want you to remember that the act of arming Palestinians with cameras was meant as to reverse the normal order of visual domination under the Israeli occupation. And that is an order where Israelis are empowered with the gaze and Palestinians are reduced to the position of displaying their bodies and their IDs, especially at Israeli checkpoints. And this reversal is unwelcome by many Jewish Israelis. So here a Jewish Israeli settler breaks a B'Tselem video camera by smashing it repeatedly against a rock in the South Hebron Hills. At official scales, the idea established a special combat unit of combat cameramen in 2012, or Luchamim Salmim. These combat cameramen served in the spokesperson's unit and were trained in both elite combat skills and camera skills. And the IDF has institutionalized its use of cameras as tools for intimidation of Palestinians in something called a mapping procedure, where soldiers searched a Palestinian home at night, gather all the residents into one room and photograph them each. And the photographs are not the goal of the operation. One former IDF soldier recalls, often we erase the image files at the end of the day. So the purpose of mapping is to use the act of photography to instill fear through a constant and very intimate surveillance. Getting back happens at civilian levels as well. In 2011, Jewish organizations began providing Israeli settlers cameras to film back at Palestinians in a direct response to B'Tselem's initiative. In B'Tselem archives, I found hundreds of instances where cameras faced off against other cameras, where Palestinians and Jewish Israelis each see and record each other in a direct tension of visioning. In a 2012 clip from outside Ramallah, a Palestinian videographer named Iyad Haddad videotaped as an Israeli soldier patrolled the aftermath of a settler attack. Annoyed at Haddad's filming, the Israeli soldier took out his own cell phone camera and filmed back. And Haddad seemed to enter a state of disbelief at this response saying, Atachayal, meaning you're a soldier. And he continued, you're a soldier, be, be. He wanted the soldier to be something else, to do something else other than to film. And in the end, he became aphasic as he tried to find the right words to beseech some kind of change. So now I'm going to give you give away the ending of the book, but you should still read it, which is that I believe that instead of seeing believe, seeing is believing, what we have is believing precedes seeing, and therefore it fair, fails to alter belief. I think we need to resist the idea that technology and cameras alone can offer emancipation. What is needed is not clearer images or truer images or more images of atrocity. What is needed is not a better way to validate the truth of the images. What is needed is not more cameras or better cameras or wider distribution networks. And of course, none of these things would hurt the effort to dismantle the occupation. Um, and they may in fact be necessary in order to dismantle it, but they're not sufficient. So I argue that we must come to accept that images do not speak for themselves in large part because what one can see in an image is already a matter of power relations that structure visibility and visuality. This is a pessimistic stance, I wanna acknowledge that. But while perhaps pessimistic, it yields that the meaning of an image and your response to it as a viewer is not fixed or overdetermined. Instead, that meaning is determined by the framing of an image, which is iterative and volatile, and which dominant regimes use their power to control. 
And a regime's domination over frame will change depending on who holds power. So in the US, images of black lynchings used to circulate as souvenirs that celebrated white supremacy. Today, we see those images very differently. And it's not that the images have changed, it's that we as a society have begun to do the work to acknowledge and rectify racial injustice. And to close, I think these archives can actually live on to haunt us. And haunting is of course, something that happens to visibility. So a ghost haunts a person, not with a touch or with a smell, but instead with a sudden appearance to the eyes. In the B'Tselem archives, images refuse to disappear. And in their refusal, they can come to visually disturb the future in their call for a justice that is denied in the present. So that's just a small snippet of the book. Here's what it looks like on the inside. And I know that it's in the USF library, thanks to our wonderful librarians. And I'm gonna stop there for now. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to Shirley's talk and our conversation. Thank you so much, Liat. I would be clapping with the clapping icon, um, but really thank you so much and thank you for making the connection to make this possible i'm so excited to be here thank you owen and alan and victoria and this is just so great that we're in conversation um and just so much here um that's really um emerging um that's beautiful i'm gonna share my screen too and I'm gonna just show you a few images first from the um, films that I'm analyzing in the book. So documentary cinema in Israel, Palestine, uh, primarily uh, focuses on um, films um, from 2000 till about um, 2009, 2010, so the first decade of uh, the 2000s, and really focuses on um, Palestinian and Mizrahi um, documentary films. So just a few images so that you can see kind of, um, kind of just the, um, the vibe of the, um, this, is, this is the last, okay. Oops, sorry. Yeah of um of um the documentaries that i'm talking about so there's an overview about the era right um the first decade and then there's um a few close readings really careful analysis of few particular documentary films and i think really what kicks off the book and what kicks off the research and what kicked off like a new era really in documentary film in 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 Palestine Israel is really this movie this film uh, Janine Janine by Muhammad Bakri that came out in 2002 after what is known as the Battle of Janine or um, Operation um, um, yeah, um, Human Shield, I, I think, um, cast led, sorry, um, in 2002, and that really documented what was happening in Janine and in uh, the Janine refugee camp after uh, that operation that was really, really atrocious. Uh, so that, that's Muhammad Bakri's Janine Janine and really inspired a lot of documentaries that came after. This is Muhammad Bakri himself from the documentary uh, Since You Left. Um, Arna's Children is a film I talk a lot about um, in the book by Giuliano Mer. Um, this is Arna. Um, Nisim Mossax, have you, ever, have you ever heard of the Black Panthers? This is a Mizrahi documentary, also 2002. Um, Kadim Wind, David Ben Shitrit also 2002 about um, Moroccan history of Moroccan Jewish uh, immigrants in Israel. This is 500 Dunam on the moon. Um, um, Rachel Leah Jones. Um, 
רוט 181, אייל סיוון, and מישל חלפי, um, and אבתיסם מרענס פרדייס לוסט, also on the cover of my book, um, and um, Yes, Effie Banai's Longing, um, also Mizrahi Iranian Jewish documentary. Um, yes, Queen Hantarisha, Israel Shire Meoded, about uh, Yemenite Jewish uh, poets. Um, yes, and this is, yes. And you can see really how visceral the images already are, right? Um, that's why I chose to talk about the body, to talk about performance. This is me uh, in a film called Reading Tehran Tel Aviv. And of course, I didn't know that I was um, filmed, but um, yeah, but then, I, but then I found out that I was. Um, and now um, in order to talk about, I wanna talk about this image a little bit and read from the book about it. Um, so I'm gonna show you um, a clip from uh, Janine Janine that really um, encapsulates um, something very, very important about um, Palestinians, 48 Palestinians, Palestinian citizens of Israel um, starting to make documentaries that really got more and more center stage, such as Muhammad Bakri, such as Muhammad Bakri's Janine Janine. Um, so I'm gonna share with optimized, this is just a few seconds, from Janine Janine. Um, just a second. Um, okay, just uh, hold on a moment. Gonna, okay. Uh, go to my video. All right, try again. Okay, thank you for your patience. And here it is. Get it. I'm Yanni Munai. I'm Arjante. Okay, and of course, um, I should say that um, Janine Janine was groundbreaking as a documentary for its aesthetics and visual style and also um, the trials that came after because there was an extremely immense pressure uh, for censorship of the of the film, which actually lasted all the way till I think this year. Yes, this year, right? So Bakri has been in court all of this time, right? And so we're talking about the visualist political, and we're talking about silencing, and we're talking about invisibilizing. Here, really, this was a very important um, landmark in documentary cinema, and also in uh, the way that it was. Um, a, a case right in court in Israel. So now I'm going to share my screen again and just um, talk a little bit about uh, this girl and about um, the relationship between um, Mizrahim and Palestinians. Um, yeah, so let me share my screens again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I'm gonna, this is me reading from the book, um, a little bit about myself, a little bit about how I got to um, writing this book that was a dissertation first and about the relationship um, of, of Mizrahim. And I am Turkish Israeli Mizrahi myself and how um, we can actually advance our own sense of solidarity uh, with Palestinians and with the struggle for Palestinian liberation. And I think uh, it does pass us through the visual in today's world. Um, that's very much a world of visual culture. Um, so here goes, this is the last section of my introduction. It starts with a quote by Sarah Ahmed, an ethics that begins with your pain. 
When asked to pick his favorite scene from any film, renowned Kurdish-Iranian Mizrahi-Israeli actor and activist Yosef Shiloach on the right um, chose the scene from Janine Janine focusing on the girl and her declaration, quote, my greatest wish is to go back home. That's the scene we just saw. And she stated it, yeah, she stated it, um, like you saw her face was really serious and then she smiled. This is the only time she's smiling in the documentary. Quote, I identify with the Palestinian people. It's simple, so simple. This is what he explained. The girl from Janine Janine was born in the Janine refugee camp as a refugee and has yet to return to her elders and ancestors home in Palestine. Although pictured as a homecoming to the promised land for Jews, the conditions informing Shiloh's immigration to and integration in Israel, to which he arrived as a child with his family in the 50s, were far from welcoming. For some of us, children and grandchildren of Middle Eastern Jewish immigrants to Israel, Circumstances have changed since the 80s, 1980s, and more so in the 90s. And this is because of the normalization of the relationship, uh, the relations, diplomatic relations between Israel and uh, some Arab states around, uh, such as Morocco, such as Egypt, for example. So with some restrictions, we can now visit our families' countries of origins in some Arab states which wasn't the case um, before. But Turkish Israelis like myself never ceased to be in touch with Turkey. So as more Mizrahi Israeli thinkers and artists advocated their reconnections to the Middle East and its cultures, I too wanted to deepen my intimacy with Turkey. So in June of 2014, shortly after starting to write this book, I flew to Istanbul to spend my first full summer there since I was a child. That access that I have always had to Turkey means the world to me. A window to my family's histories in Turkey, this world remains intact because I can make meaning of it, which in turn grants me with, seeing, with uh, some access to the delicate layers of pain that their departure from their home in Istanbul when immigrating to Israel has brought upon them that pain that, grew, that we grew up in and lived by as a family. In turn, that summer, summer of 2014, um, that, uh, uh, that summer, sorry, that access that I have to the Turkish language also facilitated my daily encounter with numerous visceral detailed reports from Gaza in the Turkish media that humanized Palestinian pain really in ways that the Israeli media never, never ever does really mainstream media. Um, and that's actually becoming um, worse, I would say. So, Reconnecting to my home of Istanbul while seeing, sensing excessive rage, agony, and empathy when regarding the pain of others. That, um, uh, yeah, pain of others in occupied Jerusalem or in besieged Gaza, Gaza that may not amount to politicization single-handedly, and I think Liat was pointing out the, that. Rather, it takes perpetual learning and training to try and relate to the pain of others in a politically informed and committed manner. This is a pivotal argument that this, books, this book makes. It is driven by my outlook as a Mizrahi Turkish Israeli scholar and by my sorry, by my wish to enhance Mizrahi solidarity with the Palestinian struggle. Mizrahi thinkers, artists, and organizers like Shiloh 
and like the filmmakers and subjects of the analyzed documentaries who for years have been nurturing an unapologetically Mizrahi opposition to Zionism and solidarity with Palestinians. They taught us that our pain as Mizrahi immigrants is real and nonetheless inextricably intertwined with the pain of Palestinians since our homes in Israel were constituted on the expense of their home of Palestine. But what might it feel like, this is a book about feelings, um, for a Mizrahi reader or spectator to take in and live with the hopeful eyes, fervent longings and political demand of the girl from Janine Janine to return home. So I'm very much writing this as a Mizrahi person and I'm, and I'm, and I'm looking at you Mizrahi readers for this. When reading about or watching, and if we let it, also feeling the pain of another person that has been living on through ongoing effects of an oppression that we ourselves did not, or perhaps we did but experienced or expressed it differently, what kind of emotional and ethical labor made the feeling harbor? This is my last paragraph. Documentary cinema from Israel Palestine emphasizes the pressing need to watch documentaries centering Palestinians and Mizrahim side by side, not in order to spread peace and love, but uh, uh, between the two victims of Zionism in Israel, but rather to deepen our understanding of another people's pain, which is unlike ours. Connecting the dots between the experiences of pain of Palestinians and Mizrahim, we may also hear the unequivocal demand that all of their documentary performances place on us to viscerally engage in intersubjective accountability. I'm going back to Sarah Ahmed in another quote from her. An ethics that begins with your pain involves being open to being affected by that which one cannot know or feel, end quote. I encourage readers, spectators, to try and believe the people who are expressing pain in a way we may have never heard before and consider some alternative realities to the ones typically perceived and lived, even if they uncomfortably ask us to change from who we knew ourselves to be so far. And I really believe that that can happen and happens all the time. This book advocates for the transformative power of relating to another fellow human's vulnerability and taking on the risk of complicating, confusing, and even adding to our immediate experience of our own pain for the sake of holding space for their humanity in ourselves. More often than not, those who care for the pain of others are found in relative vulnerability themselves, political, physical, mental, thus chancing their becoming further undone. But uh, as Tourmaline inspires us to believe, Tourmaline, the really wonderful artist and thinker, quote, if we were to ever make it to the next revolution, it will be through becoming undone and undoing that touches ourselves and touches each other and all the brokenness we are. To become undone is the greatest gift to ourselves. Documentary cinema from Israel, Palestine hopes to be of interest for anyone who wishes to understand their own feelings of powerlessness as not one with them privately and naturally, but rather as political, public, relatable and changeable. So this is where I'm going to stop. And I'm so looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shirley, that was so wonderful. Um, Oren, do you wanna jump in here or should I just go for it? Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to you both and uh, I'll, you should just jump in. I'll jump in after your conversation and uh, I'll take questions from the audience. 
So Shirley and I um, prepared a, a little bit for this, of course, by reading each other's texts and being in dialogue. And Shirley, just hearing the part of your book that you shared, um, the things that stand out to me really are this question that you have about what, what it can be not just to spectate, but actually to use the act of spectating and of watching to really have an embodied relation to someone's pain, right? Like a true, um, a true connection where you can relate to their vulnerability and specifically doing that from a Mizrahi standpoint towards Palestinian pain. Um, and it's something I really relate to. So I'm also as a Mizrahi Jew and one of those Mizrahi Jews who recently was able to go back to Morocco and see my family's um, spaces where they were. And so I guess one thing I continue to struggle with is um, the what next question, like what happens, what happens when you can relate to the pain? Like, is there something politically agentive in that relation? And maybe a question relating to your book and the movies that you study, I'm really curious what that was like for you in terms of your own political reckoning that you did, because in the book you talk about really turning to these films as a way to understand your own relation to the, the spectacle of violence after the second intifada, and also what it might do for, for me as a spectator and for someone else who's maybe has a different body than mine, whether that's Palestinian or Jewish, but not Mizrahi, like what kind of agency there is in that relation of pain. Thank you so much, both for the stunning talk, the really important, wonderful book, and, and for this um, for this conversation and for this um, opportunity and encounter. In terms of my own, I'll start maybe with my own politicization. It's actually, um, I think it's interesting. I think that um, I, I I, uh, I work a lot with JVP New York. I'm actually on the leadership team in, 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 a, in our um, you know, chapter in New York. I hear uh, a lot of American Jews talk about how they were raised Zionist and something happened in college. And so for me, I was born in Tel Aviv. I grew up in, 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 in Tel Aviv and I was very, very aware of the oppression of Palestinians from a very, very early age, actually myself. I thought, oh, um, the first Intifada is when I um, happened when I was in the second, started when I was in the second, I think in the second grade. Um, and so I was really like brought into this by um, uh, an elementary school, beloved elementary school teacher who was just um, taught, teaching us, um, you know, the Bible, the Bible stories. She was, you know, our teacher teaching um, literature and the Bible. And in that way, she really politicized the stories to make us very aware of the West Bank. And so that's something that I feel like, oh, I had that from a very, very early age. But what I didn't have is my own politicization around being Mizrahi, which really happened so much later in my life. Like it happened when I was almost in my early 30s. And now I think back, oh, my parents are Turkish. They're not Israeli. They are Zionist. Otherwise they wouldn't be in Tel Aviv, right? But they, uh, but they never raised me like with the cult, with the culture, I wasn't raised with the with the culture, the Zionist Israeli culture, and so I think I was able to politicize very early in my in my life because because I, I also didn't have that, which speaks to I think what you're saying, Liat, about like what are the conditions, what is the context, where are you, right? Um, in terms of um, like the backdrop, right? When you when you get politicized. And um, I think we, we could come back to yeah. Shirley. We're here to practice. Oh. We're gonna, oh. Well, Surely, when your internet comes back, we'll get back to you. Liat, I'd like I I just sort of jump in and and um, engage 
briefly with with your work and i want to want to ask a question um sort of shirley was sharing a little bit about her own positionality and her own oh you're back okay you're back i'll ask you later okay not back let's we'll try again um liad i wonder if you could speak sort of answer a similar question about your own sort of positionality you've spoke about being an israeli citizen and it being illegal for you to go to certain places but having gone on your own um but i'm wondering if you could speak about your own sort of identity your own your sort of multi-layered social identities and how that brought you to this work both as a scholar but also as an artist like what what's your what politicized you to be willing to go dive into these Betselem archives that you admitted make you sort of nauseated to watch what happens in them, but to spend countless hours engaging with these videos? Um, yeah, sure. So um, I uh, grew up in mostly in Philadelphia um, to a, um, a mixed Mizrahi Ashkenazi family. Also, um, so my father is a is from Morocco, emigrated to Israel with Aliyat Noir, which was the big push to bring Moroccan Jews, especially young Jews, to the state of Israel, um, and then ended up here, where my my mother's family is engaged in um, long traditions of um, of the Jewish diaspora, especially in the U.S. and fundraising and for the state of Israel, um, and. You know, I grew up, I, I have that, if not now, sort of story. So if you, if you haven't heard of If Not Now, um, they're an organization that really challenges the things that they were taught in the American Jewish diaspora about Israel in particular. Um, so I grew up going to Jewish day school after a brief stint of living in Jerusalem as a child. I grew up here in the States, um, going to Zionist socialist sleepaway camp in Pennsylvania, um, and my camp actually, um, before the State of Israel was founded, was one of the places where the Palmach stored some of its um, explosives that were then smuggled to Palestine. Um, and I always sort of touched, touched the political situation and then came away. Like it was very clear to me that that was a very, um, that was a very hot, Thing to touch. It wasn't like something you would talk about every day in the spaces where I occupied as a, as a child. And so as I sort of became, as I came into my own as an artist, I worked a lot in video. And video was really my medium. And I know Shirley Bahara also, Shirley, you have training as a visual artist before in your training as an analyzer of visual art. So we have that in common. So when I when I moved to Tel Aviv in 2013 to, on a year long residency, um, I was continuing to produce video and then happened to meet the director of the Batel video project, which for me became like at first a formal interest. Like I was actually really interested in what citizen video looked like and specifically citizen video from a place where I had never been, a place that was so close to me um, can see the separation wall from my parents' apartment in Jerusalem, but I had never been across it. Um, and so it was really through that encounter with the video that I began this project. And the project definitely, um, definitely radicalized me in many ways. I would say that it was also very intimate. So I mentioned there were 200 cameras in the field and that's a lot. And it's also not too many to get to know someone's hand in their footage. So I began to really understand like what the cadence of a videographer's breath sounds like when he's behind the camera. And I would recognize that through many, many clips that that one videographer would take. Or I would get to know who had a, a window that was directly opposite a checkpoint in Hebron. And so I would always see that one checkpoint always from that window, always from that family. So it actually became like a very intimate project, um, even though 
you know, in my sort of analysis of it, it's, um, I, I go more abstract with it. So, um, and I think that tension between the intimacy and the bigger picture of the occupation and the conflict, and my, my real core question is of um, what images cause change? Can they cause change? And how do they cause change? That was something that was really circling in my mind as I did that. And my work really vibrated between the intimacy of the personal and the bigger question overall. Yeah, that's very interesting. I, I appreciate that. And Shirley, can we welcome you back? I think you are now back. Yeah, apologies for that. Um, I'm trying to stabilize. Yeah? Yeah, okay. Wonderful. Um, did you want to? Did you want me to just finish the sentence from earlier? Or yeah, I I don't know where I got cut off. Um, but I think I, I was saying um the the practice of um of watching documentary film, the practice of reading um and analyzing visual culture, right? Is a practice. It's a it's a skill. It's a muscle that we can keep training and keep developing, right? And so the close readings, the close analysis in the book are exactly for that. Like I'm trying to really walk you through the scene and really like bring you into the, the, the person participating in the documentary, right? Like what they are saying about the impact of the experience, oppressive experience uh, on their body. So really to bring them in, you in, as a reader, a spectator, to the performance, right, like to weighing about their experience. So it's just something that we're practicing. That's the the book campaign we have right like as in a, in a very very special invitation first and foremost for for Mizrahi Shirley, you, you cut out a little bit there at the end, but I think what I'm hearing is that you're asking like an invitation through that close reading. And you're I love that you're framing that close reading as a muscle, right? It's not just um, looking, it's watching. And the difference between those is that watching is active, whereas looking doesn't have to be. That through through watching, we get to to relate in that way. And I'm really struck by you talking about how you started your project in 2014. Um, during the, yeah, we lost you. Um, I was just reflecting on what you said and then I was gonna continue to say that I'm struck by the way you talk about 2014 um, and the way that you actually experienced that in Turkey through a media that was not Israeli or American, but Turkish and the way that it related to Palestinian, um, to Palestinian loss at that time. And in, in my book, I, I talk a little bit about that time and specifically, you know, you sort of mentioned casually that um, the denial of Palestinian grievability has gotten worse over time. And in my book, I talk about how B'Tselem paid for an advertisement that on the radio read the names of all the Palestinian children um, that died in that operation, um, but that the Israeli Broadcast Authority refused to air it even after it was paid for, sort of as an example of that. And I really am drawn to the way that Judith Butler analyzes grievability, right? Who is grievable, who is not? And how in many times um, war is a time where a, a group decides that certain lives are more grievable or less grievable than others. And also I bring in sort of Daniel Doerr's analysis of earlier in, 20, in 2002 and this idea that there is a suppression of guilt that um, results. And so 
when I think about looking at video, which is what I, I do in this project, I also think about how that denial of grievability might be in the very frame of the video itself, like literally where it's positioned, how it is, and how one actually comes to it with your own ideas. And that those ideas can be part of what actually frame what you take away from it. So I'll stop there, Oren. I wonder if you want to turn to audience audience questions at this time, or and I wanted to apologize again for the internet connection. And I think my question to you was going to be about really how, as a visual artist, you kind of came into the, this work and the threads. But I think you also already touched upon that. So thank you. So. Thank you to both of you. I, I am extraordinarily compelled and interested by both of your projects um, as both an observer and as a scholar activist and someone who teaches about Israel-Palestine, including through use of the visual image. Um, so what both of you uh, are doing in your project is certainly conducive to my thinking and my scholarship, but also my teaching. And I'm, I'm extraordinarily grateful to you both for that. I want to offer or open uh, or invite everyone who has questions to put them into the q and I I want to ask uh, maybe one or two questions of my own before I open it to others, which is to say first that uh, the visual image is very much like the written word in that the moment uh, we encounter either the written word or the visual image is also the moment that we begin the process of interpretation. The people who view the images, either the documentary films that filmmakers, directors make or uh, that citizen vide videographers, like in the Batsellum project, uh, record, they do it with a particular purpose, but then they open it, but once it is seen, whatever they intended could be gone or interpreted in different ways. And also they're doing it in a particular moment. There's also a future in which once that image exists, Right in Janine Janine, it's 2002. We see all these images in the Batsellum project more recently. But these are images that are theoretically there forever that will be interpreted on and on and on. So I'm curious to know how you both respond to this question about if interpretation, not just in the present, but also in the future. Who views these in the future? What can we take from these images both in the present and in the future? And what is the purpose for the future of, of these visual images? And Leon, I think you actually addressed this in some specific ways in, in your book, so. Yeah, I'm happy to answer it. I just saw you're unmuted, Shirley. So I was wondering if you were about to jump in. No, okay. Um, yeah, the question of audience and of time is really relevant for the archive, but also for the Batsellum videographer who's filming. So I can say that um, I asked this question of, of Batsellum vid videographers who I met with, like, who, who are you filming for? And I got a lot of different answers. So oftentimes um, there was, I, I saw that they began with themselves. I'm filming for my children. For instance, especially um, women who videotape in Hebron would say this. I live in Hebron, there's a lot of settler attacks. When I film, my children are safer. So it's literally a shield in the present moment. Um, I heard from others, like when I asked them, who's the audience of your footage? I also heard this more broad abstract one, which is the world. Right? This is the concept that the world is watching. And this idea, um, which I, I saw oftentimes in the field that even if justice is denied in the present, 
at least there is a recording of it for the future. So I'm thinking specifically of one woman, um, Widian Zaban, who I spoke with, who lived in Burin, which is a small village in the Nablus region. And she said to me, you know, I film and nothing happens. Like there is no justice. There will never be any justice. And I found myself asking her like, what makes you keep filming? Like, if that's your stance, like how do you find it in you to continue to record? It's, it's she puts herself in danger to record sometimes. It's, it's, it's so much energy to, to try to do that. And she said, um, I just have to hope that one day there'll be something that comes of this. So I think in her response, I really see that call to, to almost what happens to these recordings when they live on in the future, right? Can these archives come back to haunt us? Um, what will their haunting mean to us now in the present? Like what, what might it mean if you knew a ghost was gonna be there tomorrow, right? If you, were, if, if you had to face that ghost, it's a question I have. And I think about this a lot too in the US, like where are all those recordings of police body cams? right? What servers are they stored on? Are they stored on public servers or on private um, tech companies servers? Are they all on Amazon databases? Who can subpoena who? Like these are actually crucial questions about archival ownership and access that I, I think, um, and, and infrastructure, like physical infrastructure that we don't often ask. And I think Batellum thinks of its archive in this way too. And I'll end with, the, with this. Um, you know, I showed you a picture of their tapes and that's how the early footage was stored. But their more recent footage is all digital. So there's no tape, it's right, it's digital right away. And their office has already experienced a fire that was suspected to be arson and so they moved. And so they keep their footage on offsite servers and they wouldn't even tell me where it was. And so there is this sense like, this is something we have to protect for the future um, and we're going to protect it by distributing it. And I, I think that connects to the haunting that might come with the future. Thanks so much. Oh, you. Actually, um, it, um, yeah, every filmmaker, right, that I asked, um, right, like who, why, uh, the, yeah, uh, the family, the family. It has been the answer, right? Like I filmed this for my family. I made this for my family. So very much in line with what you said. Another point that I wanna kind of make or bring up is really the question about audience within 48 Palestine or Israel and, and outside, which I think is a very crucial question. A lot of these documentaries that I write about, right, um, they got way more audience, right? Like they got, like they, they were, um, popularized, right? Like they received attention outside of 48 Palestine, outside of Israel, right? In film festivals, right? Like I talk about how um, there was more Sfardi Mizrahi film festivals since the first decade. There were more documentary film festivals at large, right? Documentary was just kicking off and, the, and, um, and Palestine, Palestinian film festivals also uh, in the US and in, in Europe. And so I think um, this is a very important point, just like in terms of who's seeing, because the pressure globally is on, is on, on, on. And even that picture that I showed you briefly about, of it, this was, that was me in 2008 in a demonstration in Sheikh Jarrah. Today, people, what people know about Sheikh Jarrah and how people view what's happening with displacement and ethnic cleansing there is completely different than 2008, right? we have to attribute that also to technology i think also to how the visual was a main component and element in the overall politicization right and just like yeah um the the fact that a family in Sheikh Jarrah today is leading the narrative globally in in the media i think is really important um it doesn't mean that the israeli settlers or the israeli state is going to back off which is an interesting question, right? But but it's 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 huge. Muhammad al Kurd, Muna and Kurd, that's huge. Um, yeah. Yeah, they were they were named this past year in the top one hundred list of most influential people in the world, according to Time Magazine. So 
there's clearly a shift and and they are they are having an impact um i have many many more questions but i i will ask some audience questions uh and i'll ask you some more of my questions if we have have time so um there was a uh someone's asking if you saw the recent short documentary film by rona Sigal, who studied film while serving in the idf called i asked fellow ex-Israeli soldiers to tell me their story. And it was released by the New York Times today. Um, and it, it interviews Israeli soldiers about their time in Hebron. So the question is, in speaking simply about their service and experiences, the soldiers reveal how what they think of as regular soldiering practices are incredibly harmful in all senses of the word to Palestinians. So if you've seen this, or even if you haven't seen it, but know about it, and you certainly know about soldier testimonies in Hebron in particular. Uh, so how does that film or these ideas inform your own ideas and your theories? Yeah, um, I, I haven't saw, seen the, this particular film, but it's definitely very much a genre um, of, and I, I actually I actually start the book with a little bit about that, just because I'm trying to say I'm actually not going to cover that at all. Um, the the genre of like we call it shooting and crying, right? Like soldiers and officers and 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 right, like and of and um, officials in the Shabak and the Mossad after they retire or after they they released from the IDF, um, they go on camera whether it's it's uh, testimonies, right? Shuvam uh, Shtika, breaking the silence, or whether it's uh, documentaries and really showing remorse and guilt. And I did this, and I did that, and we still call it right. Like it's 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 essential and it's important these testimonies, and also we do call it like uh, within that genre of shooting and crying. I mean, you did the thing, and now you now you uh, of course these people take on a uh, huge risks and more and more risk, right? With Israel becoming more fascist right but but also but also it's still kind of like within that that genre of like the within right like who am i how am i thinking about myself um thinking about my own ptsd rather than thinking about waltz with bashir right the gatekeepers uh, rather than about uh, uh the, the the palestinian victims right like on on the other side um and not that they're not thinking about them at all but anyway so uh yeah so i start with a little bit about that in the book because i'm trying to say well a lot has been written about that and those are usually cis male and they're usually ashkenazi and white um and uh and i'm gonna write about something else so that's my little two cents about that yeah just to build off what you're saying Shirley and Karen thank you so much for the question um I also didn't yet see that short documentary although I saw that it came out today um, I was teaching today so I didn't get to see it um but in my own work I do engage a little bit with this form so the documentary that that Karen is mentioning in the Q&A is in partnership with Breaking the Silence which is a group of former IDF soldiers who come and give either written or video testimony about their time serving and specifically about things that have really come to disturb them afterwards. Um, and the film that I talk about in my book is Avi Mograbi Z32, um, which came out in 2008 and it's available in, in whole for free on YouTube, I believe. And it actually follows the filmmaker. So Avi Mograbi is someone who doesn't just make films about others, but he also inserts himself in the film. And it's a musical documentary tragedy that follows a, um, an IDF veteran who together with his battalion committed a revenge killing against a Palestinian. And he makes this whole film and the premise of it is that he has to blur out the face of the person who's the subject. And you can imagine like, it's very hard to make a compelling film where the person who's talking does not have a face. And so throughout the film, he continues to try to engage with ways to have his identity represented on screen. So first he blurs out his whole face, but then he leaves his eyes and mouth intact, right? And then ultimately he ends up like gluing a mask on him, but it slips 
And then finally he ends up putting a mask on in post-production, but it leads to this uncanny valley where anytime the actor puts his hand near his face, you can see that it goes under this computer graphics mask. And so I think this, this genre um, of not just shooting and crying, but also engaging with how do I wanna be in relation to that person? How, you know, in this film, Avi Mogherbi asks himself, um, am I, should I get in bed with the killer, right? He, he sits and he makes this musical out of this, his own inner drama. And I think it, the way it informs my own ideas and theories is, is to ask myself, like, I, I often ask myself, how do I wanna relate to these images? How do I wanna relate to these words? And a lot of times how I do is to think through how they do or don't engage in concealment themselves. So what does a soldier have to conceal about themselves in order to speak? What does that say about what is acceptable or not? And what is it, what is it for me to experience a, a testimony given by a soldier who has some of their identity concealed? Does it allow me to generalize and to think about every soldier who might do this? Or do I get really specific about the individual? So Karen, I'm excited to go watch that um, short documentary and thank you so much for bringing it up. I, I appreciate what the question and what you, you both of your responses. I, it sort of makes me think of this uh, documentary that's certainly in the shooting and crying genre, but that really connects both of your work with each other. The film is called To See If I'm Smiling and it, it's about a female medic in the IDF who had someone in her unit take a picture of her with a dead Palestinian body. And she had forgotten all, she had intentionally put the picture away. So it's the still image. And the whole film is, she wants to look at that picture again to see if she's smiling, to try to remember what was it like for me? What, was I smiling or not? And who have I become in this sort of time since so it just what you're talking about just in, I'd be interested at some point to hear what you both think about this sort of still image inside of a documentary and whatnot so there's another question from uh, a student for Liad says you spoke briefly about Israel not airing the B'Tselem ad about the Palestinian children that died even though it had been paid for have you dealt with censorship with your work in the US or in Israel-Palestine? And if so, what response or action do you take to address the censorship? Um, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, when I was writing the book in 2018, there was a, a proposed law in the Israeli Knesset, which is like the legislative body of the state of Israel, to, um, to make any act of taking video of soldiers illegal and punishable with very grave um, repercussions, and to also make any act of distributing that footage or stills or images illegal as well. So that would have made the publication of my book um, a crime in the state of Israel. That law did not pass, although it gained a lot of momentum. And of course, like many laws that are um, that are proposed that come from more of an alt-right perspective, they actually oftentimes build up momentum for the politician that's proposing them, even if the laws themselves don't get passed. So that was like my, my brief flirtation with censorship. Um, I have not directly dealt with it myself, although I... I can say like there's many spaces that wouldn't want to hear the kinds of things that I talk about in my book. And I'm very aware of that in, in this context. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, so there's another question here saying, uh, first of all, thank you for the wonderful discussion. I am in the museum studies graduate program at USF. And so my question for both of you as artists and educators is, how can we contextualize visual images and videos of oppression and resistance in an institutional setting? What pitfalls might we encounter? Uh, 
I can start if you if it's yeah if it's okay. It, um, I think it relates to the um, to to the previous question. Um, I think um, contextualization again goes through education in visual culture and media, um, and um, it's uh, something like saying, well, if we're not hearing some voices, or if we are less have less access we see less vi vi uh, vi uh, visuals uh, from certain groups, from certain communities, then we probably should listen to them, right? So oftentimes, whether it's in academic setting or a, a non-for-profit, whether it's um, and kind of like, uh, yeah, a Jewish institution, um, non-for-profit or, or in academia, right? Like oftentimes they would have, um, uh, programs or, or areas like Israel Palestine, right? Like where it's it's kind of like being framed as as a symmetrical kind of kind of discussion, right? But um, actually, when you start calling it just um, Palestine solidarity, right? When you start calling the field something very specific, like we're going to look at actually Palestinian visual culture right now because we know that there is no state of Palestine right now. We know who is the oppressed group here. And that's why, right, from like really like a critical media, really like critical visual studies perspective, this is why we're going to listen to them now. So that's actually, I think, the contextualization, right? We're listening to the voices that don't get heard as much. Um, and uh, yeah, I've I've experienced a lot of censorship with that. With that, so um, I don't know if it's trying to say you should do it or you should... <laughs> no. But I, I think it's very important. I think it's very important to do. Yeah, yeah I I really love your feedback and about not pitting it as a equal as an equal um, conflict um, for this. Um, graduate student, I'm really struck by the way you ended your question when you said, what pitfalls might we encounter um, when we present these images and videos of oppression and resistance? And the one that keeps following me is, um, can we show images of violence and oppression and not perpetuate that violence and oppression? And I think about that in terms of this country and the U.S. and the struggle for um, the struggle for Black and Brown bodies, and I think about Mamie Till and her open casket um, ceremony for Emmett Till, which was, you know, the first public showing of Black death that wasn't meant for white supremacy, but was instead meant to honor Black life. But I think the question still remains that you know many scholars of visual culture and race have asked is like, can you look at these images and still honor black life? And I think the question remains for me in when I look at these images of violence against Palestinians is can I look at these images and still honor Palestinian life? In what ways do we need to see them? In what ways do we not need to see them? And it's a bigger question about images and video in general. Like where do you fall on this spectrum of I have to see that video or I don't have to see it and I don't want to. And I think my work tries to pave a path that's in the middle. And that says, I don't know that I have to see it in order to believe that we need to do organizing around oppression. But I do think that seeing it in and of itself is not going to be enough. And so that's the work that you have the capacity to do in contextualizing it in an institutional setting is to do that other stuff that the image itself can't do, that it's the image isn't enough for, that's what you get the chance to do. So it's like a challenge and a responsibility and an honor. I also just wanted to add one thing I was thinking all through uh, that year, 2014, right? And we're talking about the massacre in Gaza. And of course there was um, also the killing of Michael Brown, right? And the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement as a global movement at that moment, right? And how striking it is that, right? Like the surveillance cameras from that grocery store where like even, you know, even in the New York Times, they were trying to depict 
uh, Michael Brown, right? Like the, the, the boy who was shot and killed by the police, right? As, as if he was like stealing stuff from the grocery stores or whatnot and editing and doctoring, right? Like the, those images like to, so that really speak to like the questions I think actually you're raising, right? Like about seeing and about what are we seeing, right? Um, and, and how and how are we looking? But just to go back to how 2014 was such a, pivotal moment and also how we're thinking about the interconnectedness of the struggles, right? There was a lot of show of Palestinian solidarity with um, the um, with the Black Lives Matter uh, movement that came out of Ferguson and, and, and vice versa. And so um, just want to say that. I, want, I think this is a very profound and important place to sort of stop and to leave us all with these thoughts from 2014 and the sort of interconnected nature of these struggles and the role that the visual image plays because the visual most certainly is political. And I think you've both made a very prominent case for that. Uh, this evening. And I want to thank you both for being here and spending time with us this evening. And I also really want to thank you for the labor of writing the books that you have both written, because they are deeply important. They are remarkable works of uh, scholarship and of activist scholarship. And I'm very grateful to both of you. So thank you for coming and thank you everyone who was here also for coming and uh, get these books, read these books and we hope to see you at another Jewish Studies and Social Justice Program event in the coming semester. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you so much.